morning, everyone. Welcome to this panel discussion on misinformation. Um, I commend you for joining us this early on a Saturday morning, but I hope we'll get you off to a really lively start. I'm Carla Ross. I lead the research and evidence team um, in Wellcome's public engagement department. Uh, misinformation and the potential for large-scale platforms uh, like the social web in public engagement have been topics of interest to us for the last two years. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today to bring together really three really interesting speakers. We've got lots of different ways to think about misinformation today and how the science and uh, health research sector should respond to it. Before I introduce them, I'll just talk a bit about format and, and timings. Um, each of our three speakers has around 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes to present their work and ideas. Um, then we'll have a quick comfort break for the speakers and give you some time to think about some questions that you can pose in chat. And then we'll open up the floor to the, the chat function. So today we're going to explore information and misinformation um, with a particular focus on health and a particular focus on the social web. There's, there's no doubt that the rapid spread of information, especially in certain contexts, has the potential for tremendous good and tremendous harm. And no doubt we've all been shocked and surprised and maybe less surprised at what we've seen and heard on, online on the pandemic this year. But in a world in which ideas about health is socially and culturally constructed, and with the huge growth in the internet, there are over 1 billion health-related searches on Google every single day, and huge growth in the internet. I'd quite like us to have a deeper conversation on the shades of gray. If this is something that's here to stay, um, how do we think differently about information and in information sharing about health, and how do we think differently about the internet? Um, I'm sure we've been all been in lots of discussions where we felt really angry at misinformation sharers and come away feeling really right. Today, I'd like us to sort of think actually less about the black and white and how do we scratch between the surface and understand some of the dynamics at play and the implications of these. If the social web is here to stay, what kind of catching up is the health science and research sector um, got to do and, and what should we do about it. So we're going to hear from three different speakers. I'll introduce them um, all now so that we can make the technology simpler and each speaker will hand over to each other. So first up, we'll have um, Dr. Patricia Kingori. Patricia is an Associate Professor in Global Health Ethics at the University of Oxford, and her recent research explores fakes, fabrications and falsehoods, and really gets into those shades of grey that I was talking about. Today, she'll be exploring things like soft facts, why trust isn't straightforward, and the role of power in ethics. Next, we'll have Daniel Mikhailov. Da Daniel is founder and head of Welcome Data Labs, a sociologist by background. And so not surprisingly, his team explores really interesting things at the intersection of technology, health, science, ethics, and product development. And he'll be exploring how the web is enabling self-organization, new kinds of expertise, um, and in doing so is creating a landscape that the health and research sector now needs new kinds of capital to operate successfully within. And then third, we have Teo Medipin. Teo is innovation director at Shift. Shift are a social innovation firm who work by taking people-centered and collective approaches to social challenges. And Shift recently co-authored a rapid study for us with our department um, to explore misinformation and public engagement and to think about the need for a more holistic approach. Today, Teo is going to take us through the findings and conclusions of that report and set out some uh, potential roles in the system for the sector to respond to. And they may be phrased in ways that are, are sort of different and surprising to the research sector. Um, so I'd encourage uh, an, an open mind and um, engagement with those. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Patricia for the first talk. Patricia is actually on holiday and joining us from a hotel. So actually, extra super thanks for joining us um, from holiday. Um, and because of that and a slightly unstable internet, I'm going to share my screen with Patricia's slides and she's going to prompt me when I need to push the next button.
Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Carla, for that uh, introduction and also for organising the panel. I'm really looking forward to this morning and also to hear all the really interesting talks. Um, so I've started my presentation with a kind of provocation, which is the title um, is our focus on misinformation misleading. Um, and what I'm trying to do, actually, is to really push us to think about when we speak about misinformation, what gives us that kind of confidence that what we're talking about is false. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so what I'm gonna do this morning um, in the time I've got is to go through some of the key definitions, uh, provide an, an example of misinformation, which I'm then going to problematize and look through um, examples of soft facts and hybrid facts, which are kind of new terms. And then I'm going to talk about um, facts are on this kind of real fake spectrum and then um, to conclude. So can we go to um, slide three, please, Carla? Slide three, sir. Oh, okay, so just a bit about myself. As Carla mentioned, I'm the principal investigator of a four year welcome funded study based at the University of Oxford. And what I'm really interested in looking at is our kind of contemporary concerns around authenticity, around fakes, and what we can actually learn by paying attention to them. So often when people think about fakes, they, they dismiss them as useless. And I'm arguing actually that they can be really valuable as signals to either places where we need to pay greater attention or where greater confidence and trust needs to be uh, embedded. Um, so what I'm trying to do actually um, is try to collect fakes almost to analyze them and to see whether they're useful in providing signposts to area of greater concerns, um, need for better information and examples of good practice and where we can have uh, stronger practices. So my project over the next four years is going to be specifically looking at knowledge production. And I'm also really interested in um, access to quality, high quality medicines. Um, I, I've got a background in sociology and ethics and I'm also with Daniel who's got a, a fellow sociologist. So I'm also looking forward to, to hear his talk. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, so some of the key definitions um, around misinformation, I just thought it'd be really good just to hone in on what exactly it is that we're talking about. Um, when we talk about misinformation, there are lots of terms that circulate around this concept. So misinformation, disinformation, fake news, infodemics. And while they're all very different, what they have in common is um, an emphasis on information that is false, identifiably false, and also that this false information is somehow shared um, deliberately. Um, and I want to really question some of these um, ideas in the next sort of uh, 10, 15 minutes. So um, I, in particular, this notion that um, in the information that is shared is identifiably false. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, what we've seen with the with COVID-19 is the kind of pandemic has um, taken what seemed to be a kind of pre-existing problem around the authenticity of information that's shared on the internet and amplified it. So, you know, can, the ways in which someone, sim people simultaneously can receive the same information um, through globalization, through technology such as the internet um, and has really shaped the way in which this information has been shared and has raised concerns. The other issue is that um, this is a novel virus and it manifests itself in many different ways in, in different geographies. And that's allowed for there to be um, a considerable amount of uncertainty as to what is real and what's fake. Um, and this uncertainty is quite important. And I will return to this concept of uncertainty, but I think what we've seen if the COVID-19 pandemic is kind of it's brought to a head and amplified many of the issues that have happened that have been pre-existing around um, high quality information and concerns about um, what is shared. So I'm just going to next slide, please. Um, give you an example of what are the things that people are concerned about. So the death of Dr. Alyssa Granato. Um, so Dr. Alyssa Granata was the first person to receive Oxford COVID-19 vaccine in a clinical trial. 
And here's this, this is an example of the kind of story that people often associate with fake news and misinformation. So on the um, 25th of April, 2020, microbiologist Dr. Alyssa Granato woke, woke to the news that she had sadly passed away. She read that her cause of death was unclear, but learned it was had global significance. She was the first person to have taken part in the Oxford COVID-19 vaccine trial. She had apparently experienced complications only, our, only hours after receiving the vaccine and died two days later. The news of her death went viral across major social media platforms and was picked up by mainstream media, friends, family and colleagues. And they were all um, described as being shocked, uh, sad and, and shocked. That morning, Granata Twitter to declare, nothing like waking up to a fake article about your death. I'm doing fine, everyone. She updated her Twitter profile to read 100% alive. But for many... her death on the public. Her, tweet, her tweets declaring herself to be alive and well were considered a cover-up and a familiar part of any tactic of any cover-up was the denial. She continues this day to uh, receive uh, messages about, concerned about her, her welfare. So um, this is a kind of very typical kind of example when people talk about misinformation and fake news. Um, but I'm going to argue actually that what's interesting about this story is that it's really clearly not true because she's able to um <laughs> to declare herself alive even though there are people who don't believe it she is actually alive and well so this uh, example is probably much more straightforward when we're talking about things that are identifiably false what we have increasingly are stories that are not as straightforward um so i'm just going to move to the next slide please um so on Saturday the 29th of August, so last Saturday, there are over 10,000 coronavirus sceptics who are essentially conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers gathered to argue that information shared through the media about the virus is fake news and part of a secret global plot organised by Bill Gates and various governments. Simultaneous marches took place globally. Many of those who consider themselves to be corona sceptics are scientists and they believe that there is a state-sponsored misinformation campaign to promote ideas of coronavirus when it doesn't exist or is not as severe as it's currently being presented. What these examples show us actually is that the divide between sci the scientific community and the public is less clear. In the past when people spoke about public engagement and public knowledge of science they often made a clear divide between science and non-science um, and what we're seeing now is that this is, this is increasingly complicated. Um, in these concerns around the authenticity of the news that we've been given um, are no longer a respect to political persuasions. What this, these marches are showing is actually um, that uh, both ex left and right wing were on these marches in London. For example, we had the led by Jeremy um, Corbyn's brother, um, Lots of people on the extreme ends of the political spectrum actually came together. Um, and what we are now seeing is that many of the people who are anti-vaxxers are actually educated and engaged with scientific pub publications, which are published in peer review journals on vaccines, on COVID. What's increasingly interesting is the ways in which these facts are being interpreted and how um, the information is being used um, by both sides, scientists and non-scientists, but the same information. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and just a two minute notice. Okay, almost there. <laughs> so the last couple of slides is really to introduce this concept of soft, soft facts and hybrid facts. Um, the borderline between fact and fiction is increasingly becoming blurred. Um, so what we've got now is this concept um, but of, of hybrid or soft facts. Um, so what we're seeing is no longer the case that the, um, the enemy of science, in a sense, is straightforward. It isn't the ignorant or unintelligent public. Um, we're seeing that science communication and scientific journals have an important role to play in, in, this, in these soft and hybrid facts. We're seeing scientific journals having to retract at a greater rate than ever, um, studies which have got weak findings and these weak findings are used by both sides of the political spectrum 
um, either to support skeptics claims or to support um, scientific progress. Um, so what we've got is increasingly an outcome where half truths and hybrid facts are creating confusion and uncertainty. Um, and while this uncertainty isn't always deliberate, it does create space for there to be um, an erosion of trust and it does create space for um, people to really question um, what is happening in terms of who is making decisions and whether those decisions can be trusted. So what we're seeing here is a spectrum of, of information from real to fake, rather than seeing it as a binary of real or fake. Um, definitions of misinformation, fake news, etc. these will emphasize the presence of false information. But the real concern I'm arguing is actually less about whether they're real or fake, but you know, to what extent is the information that's been shared plausible? So um, what we've got, a, you know, concerns on these marches that, you know, one person, Bill Gates, has too much power. Um, is, is it possible that someone with too much power can use that power to abuse others? Is it possible that a vaccine can be released on the market that's of poor quality that can harm people? While this may not be true, the questions raised is ask us about the extent to which these things are plausible. And they raise concerns around essential the themes around trust and who do we trust? Who has the power to do harm or to do good? And how should we manage these? So what are kind of ethical issues that they raise is, you know, how should these be managed? How ought they be managed for the public good? Um, so in conclusion, final slide, um, examples of clearly um, discernible, um, I don't know if you want to move to the conclusion, the last slide. Um, Examples of clearly discernible fake news or misinformation are not actually as common as we thought. While we can see with the Dr. Alyssa Granato story, that's much more certain. For the most part, it's really difficult actually to unpick what is what is misinformation sometimes. More frequent are these kind of hybrid facts um, where facts are removed from context, minor claims have exaggerated it um, and things like that. And these hybrid facts are forcing us to engage with these shades of grey and uncertainty that these produces. And so I'm arguing actually that um, we need to think beyond these sort of real fake binary towards a spectrum. And this raises ethical questions about how information should be managed and regulated to create certainty. And also who should be doing this. So I'm just going to wrap up there. Um, my last slide, um, Carla, is just to sort of thank everybody for listening and also please um, feel free to get in touch. I'm just going to hand over now to the next speaker, a fellow sociologist, who's Daniel. I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Straight in for Daniil. No, I don't. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here presenting um, and also following Patricia, uh, excellent presentation from a fellow uh, sociologist. My focus is going to be on the communities uh, online who produce information and, and what we sometimes call misinformation. Um, a, a quick quick background, I have a hybrid career, so I'm a, academically a sociologist. My doctoral thesis was on online communities and how they produce knowledge. But um, at the same time in parallel, I've worked in the tech industry for over 20 years, often in scientific organizations where, where I led tech and data analysis teams. So part of my presentation is informed by theory, but part is informed by application and practice. Um, so the reality we are in is, uh, it, it's not a surprise to everyone that our world is transformed by technology. Um, just just a, a few headline figures. We have 
something like 1.8 billion websites. We have 4.7 billion internet users online at any one time. The volume of information is enormous. But, but there's something interesting happening. Um, the information is, and the communication uh, of that information is two-way. So we, we've moved away from the situation where experts um, were able to publish in one direction the facts to the rest of the population. Very much now the population engages, publishes their own facts, what they think are facts. Um, and there is a more even two-way uh, or many-to-many -many system of information exchange. It's worth knowing that every single day, millions of blog posts are published across the world. Every single day, hundreds of millions of tweets, microblogs are exchanged. The information exchange by the public back to each other and to the experts is enormous. Um, what, one interesting fact from my experience is that although this wave of change has been happening in other industries, uh, academia has until recently uh, not really uh, woken up to the fact that it too will be transformed, it too will be disrupted by this process. Um, and, and one key indicator of how that disruption is happening is that it is now a contested um, question about who gets to define what is expertise, what is a fact, what is knowledge, uh, in a way um, experts are unused to. Um, so who are the people um, out there who produce knowledge um, outside the, the style expertise? The, the answer is there are millions of communities of practice and shared interest online. Everything from um, people interested in um, birds and, uh, and bird watching to people interested in um, astronomy, amateur societies of scientists. Um, the biggest, of course, is Wikipedia. There is something like um, 130,000 active Wikipedia editors uh, at the moment, producing information at enormous scale, millions and millions of uh, Wikipedia articles, many of them focused on different aspects of science. In fact, one of, one of the main way the public get engaged in scientific knowledge is by searching a question on Google, which brings up a page on Wikipedia. So you have the Google to Wikipedia link, which is how many people uh, find out information today. Uh, in the health domain, uh, there are many communities who uh, also produce information to do with health. Uh, most commonly, uh, online platforms and communities uh, created by patients around specific uh, diseases that they have to deal with. Uh, often they get started for, for purposes of, of providing support to each other. Um, but actually, many of them have grown in scale to the point that they are funding and producing their own research. Some of the biggest are patients like me, for example, has about 750,000 patients involved in the online community across two, uh, almost 3,000, 2,900 different diseases uh, where they exchange information, support each other. They also produce uh, academic publications, around 100 research publications published by, by that community. Another example, uh, a global um, organization called the AT Family Data Plat Platform by the AT um, Patients Project. Um, that is focused on a particular disease, AT, um, and as is typical, started by an individual whose sons developed that disease. Now that organization is uh, fundraising and paying and commissioning its own academic research, working with some of the biggest organizations in the world, uh, academic institutions in the world, like Harvard, like the Broad Institute uh, in Boston, um, producing cutting edge research into a disease which has been um, not, uh, not so much ignored, but had little funding going to it um, from uh, mainstream pharma and, uh, and academia. So these communities have a huge, uh, positive effect um, on how they produce information. Now, some of them, as I described, cooperate with experts, but others uh, do not. And, and, and some communities, the, the current example being anti-vaxxers, um, see themselves or find themselves in opposition to experts. 
it's interesting and important to understand that what we're talking about in many cases are quite professional outfits. So, so many of them, of course, are small communities set up on Facebook um, or other social media uh, platforms. But the biggest ones are, have more resources at their um, disposal than many, than many academic institutions, many universities. So the, some of the biggest anti-vaxxer groups have millions of funding coming in from fundraising activities. So what we're talking about are quite sophisticated, sometimes organizations um, of um, online communities engaged in knowledge production. And they often create their own internal mechanisms of quality control. Again, going back to the example of Wikipedia, they have a lot of mechanisms for making sure that what they publish uh, fits their own internal uh, rules. Uh, likewise, they develop an internal culture, a culture which both bonds them as a community and defines them in opposition to, to others, to outsiders. Uh, they also become hierarchical over time as they develop and grow in size, although, although still maintaining um, a feel of uh, informality uh, and egalitarianism. So it's important to understand that we're dealing with uh, often organizations which are quite complex. Now, um, there's an interesting question, I'm sure we'll debate this later, about uh, to what extent those communities produce misinformation and challenge established expertise, to what extent they produce information which is legitimate, just, just comes from a different source than traditional academic uh, institutions. And of course, the answer is both happens all the time, and uh, I particularly like that, that aspect of Patricia's presentation. There are areas of gray here. Um, and the way experts engaged is also in areas of gray. So uh, a, a, few, a few points to make. Experts, uh, traditional academics engage with Wikipedia and Google uh, regularly for what they call pre-research. So, so, so understanding the landscape of a particular topic before they engage in research. So, so they use the tool, tools like Wikipedia um, regularly. But on the other hand, they, they, they rarely acknowledge it or cite it. There's a taboo in academic field about acknowledging reliance on uh, what are considered non-professional tools. So, so, they, so, so these uh, information sources are both used, but also not acknowledged by academic experts. Also worth knowing that, that over the last couple of decades, the practice of uh, gathering data via social media, whether qualitative data like surveys or quantitative data analyzing at scale um, tweets has grown enormously in academia. It's, it's an important source of uh, new data for research. However, um, that can go wrong. It's worth remembering that the Cambridge Analytica scandal, obviously, famously, um, uh, Facebook got a, a huge amount of backlash against uh, illegally leaking a user's data. But it's worth remembering that it started by an academic researcher at the University of Cambridge who created an app to initially legitimately get ac access to a survey for people to fill out. The problem happened that that app gathered data from more than just the people who consented to be uh, involved in the survey, but also from their friends. So there's, there was 100,000 or so people who consented, but tens of millions of people's data was also illegally accessed. So there's an interesting gray area there. And finally, um, and the biggest example, there are great communities uh, online, such as I mentioned, who publish academic research, but there are also communities online who at the same time publish information which is hurting uh, public health, anti-vaxxers being the biggest example. Um, so what, what goes wrong for experts? Um, there are a number of issues. I won't go into the detail because time is pressing, but we can pick it up in the discussion. There are problems with identity. Uh, it's not trivial online to establish who you are uh, and who you're, uh, uh, the person you're dealing with is on the other side. Authority is a problem. Experts rely on specific, specific markers of authority, their um, titles, their positions at universities, the papers they publish, the, the amounts of times those paper, papers were cited. But that information doesn't translate online when they engage with online communities. Accuracy is a problem. Experts fundamentally will always be held to a higher bar and for good reason. But that means any honest mistake or indeed not honest mistake can be weaponized against experts by online communities who, 
who are contesting what they're saying. Timing is a big problem. So fundamentally, the way online platforms are designed forces the pace of conversation, Twitter being an obvious example. Um, whereas the traditional expert approach is to take time to check the facts, um, publish a paper, get the paper peer reviewed. The conversation moves on by the time um, that process completes. So often experts feel under pressure to say things before the facts themselves are known. And the current example with COVID is, is a great example. We just don't know enough about a very new virus, but both media and social media and, and policymakers are demanding answers now, uh, which causes uh, problems and inadvertent inaccuracies in what things are published. Finally, tone. Experts uh, are seen as an elite by, by much of the public. Um, and there's often an, um, a pushback against them in online communities, um, purely because they are perceived as both an outsider and part of the establishment. Um, an important thing to understand is the point about capital. So experts, as I mentioned, are used to using a certain kind of capital in order to um, build their authority. It, it goes to publications, it goes to citations, it goes to their positions, the prizes that they won. Online, different kind of capitals are used by the online communities. An example is algorithmic capital. So how findable is your information? Um, how viral your information is, is down to what I call online social capital. Um, how much time and flexibility you have in exchanging and discussions, what I call time capital. So those capitals are much more effective online compared to the ways experts are used to establishing their authority. And uh, to, to finish and conclude, um, a few things that experts can do better in order to help get their messages across, their facts across and engage more positively online to cut through the volume of uh, alternative information, misinformation that happens. They need to build their online presence. They need to actually take time to engage with online communities and find natural allies. So the online communities of patients, for example, who are engaged in research would be the perfect allies to help expert institutions try to get information out, for example, on, about the importance of vaccines. Uh, they need to focus on accuracy. There's a problem, there are problems with, with the research culture around reproducibility. Patricia mentioned it a little bit, and I'm sure we can discuss it more, where too many uh, papers published in scientific journals uh, cannot be reproduced. Now, of course, the problem is that uh, opponents, for example, anti-vax groups will use that and weaponize that as the reason for why expert positions should not be trusted. So experts need to get their own house in order in order to, to win those arguments. Timing is important. Uh, investing in, in professional communications and in improving tech literacy among academics will help engage on social media. And finally, the tone. You must embrace the fact that the world has changed. The conversation is two way. You must show respect to online communities and groups who are engaging with you in order to have authority and establish your authority online. Um, and finally, you must be open about things that you don't know. Uh, anytime you pretend, anytime you um, think you're more certain than you are, that will be found out and your authority as an expert will be uh, undermined. So I'll stop there. I'm sure we can pick up those points in um, the follow-up discussion. And thank you so much for having, having me on this panel.
Thanks so much. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Carla, also for inviting me onto this panel. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Daniel and Patricia. Um, I really enjoyed, appreciated and resonated with your presentations. And I think some of the strands that you talked about, I think will start to um, also come through um, in what I'm about to share. So just a bit of background on me. My name is Teo. Um, I am currently Innovation Director at a um, social design um, agency called Shift. Um, we focus on helping organizations um, to play their best roles and work collectively, um, or at least collegiately, um, in the fight against systemic um, social equity issues. Um, I've spent the last 10 years um, with um, working as a design thinker. Um, so I have a deep passion for bringing the human side to business, health and social equity um, issues and challenges and designing solutions that put um, humanity at the center of innovation. Um, across my career, I've worked with organizations and partners like Samsung and Telefonica, Omnicom, um, Philips, Alphabet X, um, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Merck, and also Welcome. Um, and over the last two years, we've been working closely with the Welcome Trust um, on the topic of health and misinformation. Um, especially focused on social media. Um, we've really been thinking about um, how we might work towards a healthier internet that is healthier for health information. Um, so today I wanted to share some personal reflections really on the work we've done um, with Welcome over this time um, and make a case for rethinking um, how we think about, talk about and act upon um, the challenges presented by our current relationship between social media and health information. Um, and my aim for this project is just to take, and um, for this talk really, is just to start encouraging us to put humanity back into the center of this um, discussion that we're um, having today. So I think everyone knows this and a few of the, um, Danielle and um, also Patricia um, have shared stats that um, present this, but we know that today the internet has more users than people who have access to essential health services. So, I mean, putting aside the obvious um, problem we should all have with that, um, this means that globally social media um, is a, if not the, um, core infrastructure for public health. Um, within this, a core part of the system, obviously, as which is what we're talking about today, um, that runs on social media is health information. Um, and I guess while we know that health information and health decisions are not made um, in vacuums and are not influenced by um, binary influences, in, influenced in binary ways, we also, I guess, know um, that social media plays a significant role. Um, um, role in the information that surrounds us as we're making important health decisions. Um, health decisions such as whether to try an untested um, treatment for coronavirus or whether to vaccinate your child. Um, so two years ago, as I mentioned, we started working um, with the Wellcome Trust um, to understand the interplay between social media and decision making around health. Um, we focused on um, really just to keep the study um, manageable on the role of social media on health based decision making, and we used vaccines as a frame. Um, in the first study, we focused on um, how social media impacts the vaccine decision making journey of people, parents in the UK. Um, and in the second study, we um, interrogated the system of actors um, addressing health information online. So what struck me in this first study, or us in general, was um, which involved depth interviews with parents um, and experts across the UK, um, was that while sometimes when you go, you actually use social media to go looking for health information, the majority of the time it actually comes looking for you. Um, and we observed that through conversations with parents and sitting down with them as they trawled through their social media feeds, um, that often by the time information um, arrives at you, you're pretty susceptible to what you'll find. Um, and I think these are, um, this is true for a few obvious reasons. Um, when it comes to it's likely to come from a trusted source, it's likely to come within a trusted space, such as the forums that Daniel um, talked about in his presentation. It will likely come in a trusted language and tone and framing that you understand, and it will likely fit squarely into your worldview. So within this mix, it's inevitable that some of the information that you come across um, will be 
not true, it will be misrepresented or it might not be accurately portrayed. Um, in a survey, I think many of you will um, recognize this stat um, from in 2018, the Royal Society of Public Health um, published that nearly 50% of British parents of children under five years old regularly encounter negative messages about vaccinations on social media. Um, and when something alarming does come up on, in your feed and sits within your worldview from someone you trust, in a space you trust, in a language and tone and framing that you recognize and understand, um, and sits really squarely in your worldview, um, you can be forgiven for um, perhaps forgetting that it does not mirror what you heard in your um, doctor's waiting room or what you read um, it, as you, um, as you um, receive something in the post from um, your health provider. Um, and in your own benevolent way, often, um, you might start to share some of that information with other people you know, um, with other parents perhaps, with small babies, um, towards whom you feel you have a duty of care. Um, and I guess the more and more those you know, um, you and the people that are around you spread this information that is perhaps at times not accurate, um, and the more you're exposed to that news, um, the more it comes to mind when you are making decisions. And unlike some things that you might have read or heard in from more professional, academic or um, or um, expert eyes, um, you will feel that those are the things that you will use um, to make your decisions. And what we found, and I think this might resonate with uh, many of you, is that while social media and that information alone didn't impact um, vaccine hesitancy, it often triggered additional um, information seeking behavior. Um, it often um, triggered some hesitation. Um, and for others, it even triggered some buyer's remorse after the fact. In a 2018 survey um, of 2005, um, 2005 respondents in the UK, it was found that there was two biggest motivations for people sharing information on social media in this way. One was to inform others, and the other was to express um, my feelings. Um, and I think they were both, um, they were both um, selected by around two thirds or 66% of the um, of the audience who were responded, <laughs> sorry, add source. I should have add, added source. Um, and this suggests that the um, origin, um, that while the origin of dangerous information or misinformation or disinformation, as um, Dr. Patricia mentioned, um, may have malicious intent, often it spreads through benevolent social um, and individually oriented interests. And I think this is a very human story, um, one which is potentially made more visible and more potent online um, and through social media. But it's a story which has been true about the way that humans have cared and shared throughout um, all of time. Um, I think it's a human story that many of you will recognize in your own lives. It is definitely a story that plays out in my own Nigerian family's um, WhatsApp group um, almost um, daily. And so I just wanted to juxtapose that with um, a fast forward to our next study with Welcome Trust, um, which was, as I mentioned at the beginning, looking at the landscape of actors who were addressing health information online. Um, so my colleague, a talented researcher called Chloe Cook, mapped 150 initiatives um, that took aim at the health information environment. Um, and through desk research, expert interviews, but also by interrogating parallel information environments such as um, climate change, mental health and violent extremism, um, Chloe identified the roles being played, um, the actors playing them, but I think most importantly, um, the roles that were not being played within the system. Um, and I was struck by the, these, um, in the findings, I was really struck by how little of that human story we saw in the first project had been seen to be put in mind or placed in mind in the construction of the system and around misinformation. Um, so when we did map the impressive um, list of um, organizations and initiatives aiming themselves at the online information environment and misinformation and specifically, um, I found it striking and quite telling how many actors were clustered around and occupying controlling, countering and communicating roles. Um, and to illustrate this, although it's not um, exhaustive, um, according to Duke University's um, Reporters Lab census, there were actually 240 fact-checking websites, and that's up from 44 just five years ago. 
And personally, I have nothing against fact checking. I think it's an important part of the journey that we have to take. Um, although not one of the people that we spoke to in the um, first study talked about fact checking as a normal part of their online sharing behavior. But I think that's like an aside. Um, to me, I think while controlling information that is untrue and dangerous is important, um, while countering information um, that is, um, is critical, um, and while communicating to give people access to um, good quality information um, as they're making health decisions is crucial, um, I think over-focusing our system's response um, on um, in this way is shallow, um, a bit myopic, and perhaps wasteful. I think it's quite a wasteful way to think of the very human way that we have always talked, shared, showed care, gossiped, learned, supported each other um, online. And for me, by centering the conversation on what I'm calling error moments, um, we're missing the bigger opportunity at hand. Um, but I think, and I think you may agree that this isn't surprising, um, the exploration of what to do about um, the spread of information on internet, on the internet, which might not be good for public health, is a, a relatively new field. Um, and like many fields, it's pretty typical that at the um, early moments of that field's development, um, it can be quite disease focused, um, talking most almost exclusively about what we don't want to see um, and giving very lo a lot of airtime to the problem, but really not talking about the positive change we want to see and what look good looks like or the opportunities. Um, and we've seen this dynamic in fields like mental health, um, where we saw them move from a model of that was almost exclusively focused on mental illness um, and move to one which embraced the idea of mental flourishing. Um, we've seen this in violent extremism, which um, a field which first focused on the threat of individual isolated um, people who needs to be weeded out before they focused on embracing um, the idea of investing in an environment which, within which weeds cannot grow. We've seen it in climate activism, which has expanded a focus from climate crisis to embrace a word of sustainable adaptation and mitigation. And I think these examples um, demonstrate the journey that our discourse um, and system looking at health information on social media need to make. Um, so we need to move from deficit to um, an error and disease and issue and problem um, to a space which is strength based and asset focused and I think health led. Um, and I believe we have to make this journey fast, um, especially if this year has anything, um, has taught us anything. So our contribution as, um, I guess, outsiders in the, from in this space, um, as people who are um, designers, not academics, is to provide six provocations to everyone um, from Shift and Welcome Trust um, to, um, and I just wanted to share those six with you today. So the first one is how might we foster a field of collaborative discovery around healthier information um, and more resilient online health information environments? So in this, we are super interested in how research from diverse disciplines such as neuroscience, behavioral science, information security, philosophy, and perhaps design, what can, what can those collaborations tell us about the potential of our current social media environments that, that, that we can use to drive towards um, positive public health? Um, second, how might we encourage um, and support actors to test, learn, evaluate and open up what works to make health information environments more resilient? Um, as part of the strategy of shift, it's all about how can we do work in the collective and this we're really interested in how we can unite our efforts more. In the study that Chloe led, I was stri um, struck by how um, separate all of our efforts were and how often competing they were. Um, I would love to see us unite um, more, um, create more shared knowledge um, to understand what works and what with what groups and what geographies and, and to create collective assets that can catalyze progress in this space. How might we embolden a field of actors to take a longer term view? I think we speak a lot about what's happening now in the social media landscape, but how can we really start using foresight and collective imagination to understand what's possible, what's probable, but also start designing preferred and desirable futures going beyond the dynamics of today um, and to see to figure out what we want to see tomorrow um, in order to um, make some progress?
Number four, how might we lure the wider internet health misinformation um, community to focus on this issue with us? Um, there are amazing um, actors across the space not currently focused on health information environments. How might we recognize and lure them into our um, into this moment um, so that we and also um, help them to recognize the critical importance of centering investments and efforts on public health at this time? How might we foster connections between frontline workers and those working more upstream? We're really compelled by the ideas of mobilization and activism. Um, so we are um, seeing and supporting the abundant resources that live across the public health system um, and with commu within communities as a core asset um, and see them as co-conspirators as I think it was a term um, that Daniel used um, in creating this healthier information environment. Um, and then lastly, number six, how might we use moments like this to catalyze a field of actors um, working to make health um, um, digital environments fit for purpose for our um, public global health? Um, even before this current situation, which is when this um, work was completed, um, we were really compelled by the idea of using epidemics and pandemics um, as a guiding light in our journey towards a healthy internet. Um, and I think now, um, as we're living through COVID-19, um, we think that ever more epidemics and pandemics can provide a focus and a vision for why healthier internet is vital and what it must achieve. Um, so, I mean, those six provocations are not exhaustive. Um, they are just from one point of view, um, but they're intended to be the start of a conversation, not the end. And we hope, and I really do believe that they highlight um, ways in which we could move beyond focusing on, on only when moments when things go wrong, and um, which I can demonstrate um, here with a conversation between me and my colleague, Chloe, um, towards an environment where we're not only focused on those instances um, and we're thinking holistically about how and the health community can utilize humans' deep and often benevolent capacity for caring, um, learning, contributing, um, conversing, sharing, and creating a healthier internet that is healthier for all. Um, so following the footsteps, I hope, of some of the people that are leading the way, um, I really appreciate you having me on this panel. Um, I'm really excited about the conversation we're about to have. Um, thanks again for having me. Thank you very much, everyone. Three really uh, wonderful presentations, provocations, um, and, and um, as promised, um, shades of grey. Uh, I'm very intrigued by some um, common and consistent themes across the presentations as well, despite not comparing notes or, or sharing presentations before. Um, Trust seems to be something that that has come out actually in in each of your areas of work. And how how central do you think the the theme of trust is in information and misinformation? Um, and how can we think about it? And what should the health and research sector do about it? I'm very struck by um, a sort of itch that the academic sector has to correct facts. Um, and take a fact-based approach, and yet trust and relationships feels like something that's that's quite central in here. Um, perhaps if I can go to um, Patricia first for Patricia's um, thoughts on that. So this is a question around um, trust and academia, and I think um, Daniel spoke really well on this idea that actually um, the way in which the academia oftentimes this information is often out of sync with when people need to have information and that can be really problematic because um, you know we have been disciplined to have lots of fact checking and to make sure before we publish having said that um, if you look at articles by, um, if you look at institutions like Retraction Watch, which is the organisation that follows the number of academic journals, uh, academic articles which have had to be retracted by journals, what we see actually is a huge number and a huge increase, um, especially during COVID, of articles which have been published and then had to be published quickly and then had to be retracted. Um, so it seems that in this kind of attempt to try um, uh, and be timely, academics are also um, 
making it difficult to um, be factual. And that's a problem. And I think the issue around trust is... Um, is, uh, is, a, is, is difficult because it's not just that there is one academic community speaking in unison about a subject. Um, you know, even within my organisation of Oxford, you have people and epidemiologists on completely different extreme end of the polls as to the significance of COVID, um, the efficacy of any vaccine that's going to be available. And that lack of um, of unity, I think, is something that's actually creating the kind of uncertainty, the soft fact, the hybrid facts that I mentioned in my um, in my presentation. And one of the issues that's making it difficult to um, create trust because all of those facts and all of those divisions can create misinterpretation. I don't know if that's <laughs> enough. Or do you want me to hand over to Daniel or Teo? Very interesting um, perspective. So, and, and that fits, Daniel, with what you were saying about this real mismatch between um, the the kind of speed of the internet and and, and speed of online and, and speed of academia. But but what can we do about it? No, it it, it is one of the biggest problems. Um, academics um, just find the, the 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 tempo of work um, online doesn't fit what they're used to. Um, and as Patricia quite rightly mentioned, if anything, it gets accelerated during a pandemic because there is quite rightly a, 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 an imperative to publish fast, but that leads to errors. So what, what can we do about it? I mean, there's a few, there's a few things that, that, that strike me. One is we need, uh, as I mentioned towards the end of my presentation, try to get our own house in order more as, a, as, as the academic community. So we are really undermined by, there'll, there'll always be accidental um, mistakes, errors, absolutely, we, we, uh, as a human, things happen. Things happen. Um, but we need to get a house in order where things are not accidental. So the, the, the reproducibility crisis, so-called in academia, is, is sig a significant issue for us. Uh, so I think those are nature, um, sur survey by nature in 2016, which found that 70% of the researchers they sur uh, uh, surveyed couldn't reproduce a study. You know, the majority of researchers they surveyed believed that th there was a significant crisis, particularly in, in health and, and biomedical research. So there's a famous study done a few years back, almost 10 years now, by a pharma company called uh, Amgen in America, where they tried to reproduce uh, 50 over, I think it was 53 papers in order to see if um, they can uh, take the findings of those papers to clinical trials for their drug discovery. And out of 53 papers, only six could be reproduced. So that's a problem. Now, there is a, the, the reason this is a problem is obviously in, in, in two ways. It's a problem in itself. It means that a lot of effort is going into uh, cellular studies which, which, which don't have the quality we need. But it's also a problem secondary because it allows opponents of researchers, anti-vax groups, etc., to uh, uh, an open goal. They can say, "Look, look at look at your work. It's not reproducible. It's not, it's not, it's not high quality," and it's a it's a hard one to defend against because it is partly true. Now, of course, it is easier, as I said, there's a higher bar for academics and experts to clear. It's easier to criticize academics for errors that they make when you yourself find. Uh, have no um, need to um, you know, uh, reproduce your own work, but but none of us is very effective, and the public will always expect academia to have um, to do better and have a higher bar. So I think that, that that's definitely something that can be uh, improved by academia itself. It's a big problem; it'll take time, but we need to do it. A, a shorter term solution, just a small small one, and then I'll hand over to my colleagues is also just transparency about the academic process itself. I think part of the problem is the public do not fully understand the scientific method, that it is a single paper being published about something new doesn't necessarily mean that thing is proven. And this, this becomes a problem when, when media picks up those papers, single, single papers, and splashes the findings on, on front pages. The way scientific method works is you publish the initial study, others try to test it, 
they try to counter it. They, they find other um, alternative explanations. There's a process that, that takes some time before the community feels the findings are robust. And of course, that is hard, both in the world of social media, which demands immediate answers, and at the time of pandemic, when again, we demand immediate solutions. It's very interesting. So um, one of our points is that actually, first, the sector needs to look to itself and, and where it needs to make improvements in its own processes and cultures. Um, I, on, on the theme of um, sort of... I'm so sorry. Are you, are you happy for me to um, just add something to the discussion? Yeah, I was about to um, ask you a question, actually, Teo, because what, what struck me was the thinking fast and thinking slow. Um, and one of the findings of our report was was how can we think about the design of the internet to slow down thinking so while we might be thinking about how can research speed up how do we um, slow down thinking so that people can um, pause um, before they hit the share button or pause before um, they digest and think about that and I was going to ask you about that and I do add any other reflections I just I just really want to pick up on this issue of trust and I think it's really important and I love what um both Patricia and Daniel have said. Um I think often um what I'm struck by is we talk a lot about whether or not the public trusts academics and I don't know that we speak enough about whether academics trust the public. Um and I think that's at the heart of something that I think is a bit um misaligned because um when you have dynamics like as you say Daniel um a scientific process at play um, um, there's been quite a reluctance to ex to explore that um, that uncertain moment and that uncertainty with the public, and that has that often drives people into corners of the internet, and which we can't see because they go deeper and deeper and use hashtags that we are not able to recognize um, and have those conversations in realms where academia cannot penetrate. Um, so I do think we have to start putting our faith and trust in people um, to have these nuanced discussions. And when we hold them away from them, um, that's, I think, the chasm between um, what is factual, fact based or factual um, and the things that people then start to assume as um, as true within their worldview um, and start to talk about within their peer groups and share and spread. Um, so I do think that's a really um, important topic, but one that we should make multidirectional. Um, and then I think on the, um, the question you bring up, Carla, on the idea of um, faster or slower thinking, I think um, absolutely. Um, I'm of the school of thought that the way that humans interact online um, will probably be the same forever it's we've created a system and environment and our response to that is typical um we will hit things that make us feel good and seem fun and are interesting and are exciting and i don't think i don't live in a worldview where we can change that very human dynamic um so i do think while that is probably going to pr um, be present all the way through all the permutations of the internet um, and any other um, media that comes um, comes next. Um, we really do have to think about how we can um, bridge the gaps and have this trusted relationship at the center um, so that even when I'm pushing, pressing like and sharing at a very quick speed, um, I am part and parcel of this um, process of discovery, which science is. Um, and I feel that I understand and know my place in it more. I'm trusted within it. and. Um, and then even when I do accidentally share something, I feel also cushioned with the fact that I haven't done it with malicious intent and the people that receive it may um, be able to discern what's um, fact from fake. Carla, can I just add something? Because I, I really liked what, um, what I just said, uh, particularly the, the first thing about, we don't talk about enough about academics trusting the public. I think that's so true. Um, a thing to add there is, uh, it was mentioned that there's all the fact checking go goes on as an activity. Uh, so academics think, well, well, let's say an anti-vax message pops up or video goes viral. The first thing we do is say, this is wrong and this is why it's wrong. These are all the facts which are. And, 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 and we know from, all, from uh, analysis that that's not effective. It doesn't change minds from the public. What we don't do enough of is, is, is understand why do people share it? That's why I love the, uh, the work that I was presenting. Um, so for example, on, on anti-vaccination, the, 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 the um, issues that parents have and the fear that parents have, for example, 
uh, that their children are harmed um, is is an emotional um, uh, reaction, but 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 an understandable one. As a parent, I know it. So so I I, I the worst thing that could happen to me is when something happens to my child or or, or, or they're, they're ill. So how about in, instead of focusing all the energy on fact checking, how about understanding what the the actual concerns are and engaging proactively with people, um, to listening to their concerns, having much more of a public engagement two-way conversation role so that people feel listened to. Uh, often the reason anti-vax groups are so successful is because they they actually seem to listen to the parents and, and where well, scientists and experts don't, all they say is no, no that's wrong. Um, so I, th I think that there's a re really something really important there. That, that means much more energy and effort by the scientific community in two-way co conversation. Um, and, and seeing that activity as, as important as the production of new knowledge. We know that a lot of the reasons about reproducibility crisis is, is, is down to the pressure to publish, so-called. Pu people publish more papers than they should in the sense that they're rushing out numbers, quantity over quality. Well, how about as a system we say publish less, publish higher quality, spend more of your time engaging with your public, explaining the things you've already researched. Um, so just, just reimagining what science looks like. Who, who should be doing the reimagining what science looks like? Should it be scientists? Should it be the, the public? How, how should they go about it? Um, and there's a lot of strong incentives at the moment for um, for publishing, for applying for grant funding. How how, how do we um, start to shift that? And do, do funders play a, a role in this too? Yeah, absolutely. The, so the whole system, including the public, and science isn't separate from society. It's part of society, and we as scientists are responsible to society for for for, for what, what we do. So it needs to be a, 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 an all system activity the public, the scientists, the funders of science, the journals publishing. One of the things that I've done uh, over the last couple of years with, with a number of colleagues is form something called the Research on Research Institute. It's a virtual institute which is dedicated to um, researching how funders, ju uh, journals, etc., inadvertently have unintended consequences. How should they make different decisions? So they encourage, for example, researchers that they, they grant fund to have um, to not feel pressure to, to publish work which isn't ready, potentially, or, or spend more time and get, get an actual credit or recognition for other activities like public engagement, like education, like training new generation of, of younger researchers, all activities which are currently uh, not recognized or credited by, by, by the research system. So I think it's a whole system activity in, involving everyone, including the public. Patricia, when you think about um, the insights that are coming out of your work and Daniil's proposals there, um, what, what do you reflect the, the big shifts that um, academia can make, but also who, who it might do that with? Academia is very famous for, for being an island on its own. Um, and perhaps, Teo, you can also share some reflections on um, how people-centred approaches that are so strong in the design world could, could be used within academia. I think actually one of the really great points that's coming out from um, Teo and Daniel's presentation is actually it's not really that scientists have to make the shift. I mean, the shift is happening. Scientists have to get on board. I mean, the public are demanding a different way of communicating, um, a, a different way of interacting. And I think that's something that have, I think, Daniel's presentation and Teo's presentation have both clearly demonstrated as have caught academia a bit on the back foot. Um, and this is something that scientists and academia have to get on board with. And by that, I mean that this demand um, to present things as factual when they're um, still a working progress, I think, um, you know, the public has to be trusted um, with the nuance to understand that these things are still works in progress. I think that is something that people have to be trusted with that information. And there is something about the ways in which not doing that is actually in itself undermining trust. Um, so the shift from the is happening. I don't think we, <laughs> I don't think uh, what we have to do is to actually to try to get um, in 
you know, on board with what the public wants. It's no longer for academia or science to necessarily to lead that, but to think about collaborating um, and finding different ways of engagement and involvement. I think my work certainly um, has been interesting in a sense of looking at exactly what gives people the confidence that they're dealing with things that are real or fake. So what you have are people who feel very strongly that, you know, if an article is published in X journal, it must be real. Or if it's coming from this particular institution, it must be fake. Um, and that's creating all sorts of um, interesting sort of confusions I think because what we're seeing is, is all of those proxies really don't necessarily mean the same thing so um, you know high impact journals are as we've said retracting at a rate never known before <laughs> um, articles that have been published um, that were considered real at one point and some of the most interesting insights that we're getting from from, for example, COVID or pandemics are coming from institutions that didn't have a world stage or a platform and they're providing novel and interesting insights. So all of the markers that we had previously of what was real or what was fake, institutions, people and things are changing. Um, and academics can't be in a space where they can just dismiss that. Um, one of the things I thought was really great um, and is built on my previous interests um, that both Daniel and Teo mentioned was the role of frontline workers. Um, so up until now, we've all often just ignored them, actually, <laughs> just either assume that they're um, aligned with the scientific message or that they're somehow some the public, but actually they represent a specific and quite unique online community that I think that we could do much more to engage with because their sense of what's real or fake is incredibly powerful. Um, they're really important interlocutors um, in, the, um, in science communication. Um, and we've seen, for example, in the UK that a lot of what was considered to be scepticism either around vaccinations, around COVID, was shared by this um, by frontline workers in, uh, in, in the NHS, either about the quality of vaccines or about certain cures. Um, so I think actually not necessarily talking to people in the ivory tower, but people who occupy this space um, as key interlocutors um, of science information is gonna be really important, I think, to bridge the gap between um, kind of quite uh, removed and detached academics um, and the public. Thank you. If I can ask Teo for some reflections on that. And then we've got two questions from the audience as well, which I'll put to you. Um, yeah, I think these are all really good points and um, I don't know which part of that to pick up, so I'll just pick up something <laughs> I, I was thinking about as you spoke. Um, I guess a part of like my practice as a human centred designer is like trying to unpick like the cultural, social or personal logic that underpins behaviour. So it comes from a worldview that um, there is a very valid reason that people behave in the way they behave because, and it's a system that is um, doing that, that is contributing to that. And it sort of sees that as like the natural response. So then that suggests that actually all our work is to look at the system which we have surrounded people with and understand how that system dynamics is working. I'm really excited to hear about Danielle's research and researchers um, initiative because I think that's where um, the effort needs to be placed. Like we are, spe we do spend, and I spend a lot of time talking to the public, um, but we should do some of that internal reflection. Like who is really understanding like how it feels as a researcher to know that your only way to progress in your career is to get published as frequently as possible. Like that is your barometer for success. How does it feel to then neglect your duties in publishing to go and engage the public um, so that they can better understand your science, um, your evidence and where you are in your process so I think like if we are able to spend some of our system effort and resources on really taking a human-centered approach on ourselves as humans as the humans that make up this um, scientific community and then also looking at the systems and um, the 
incentive structures that surround us as people and then also looking at the social media environments and the incentives that um like are at play there i think we can almost work then end up working back to real opportunities for change um i think we do need things to happen on both sides i do think we still need to understand why people share misinformation why they trust it and i think that's a really important part of it but let's not neglect the other humans on the other side of this spectrum um, who have really important um, roles to play in what happens next. That's really interesting. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to come back to um, the idea of incentives and what incentives mean to the public and what incentives mean to the, the researchers, because that feels like that's something that's come out in all of your research. Um, in, the, in the meantime, we've got two um, questions from, from the audience. Um, there's one reflection that not all information misinformation has the same um, behavioral consequences. But there's a question here, should we differentiate between misinformation that we give attention to and try to counter? Um, you know, is there some misinformation that should be ignored by experts? Um, and the second question is support for the idea of stressing that academics should listen to and, and trust the public and publish less. Um, but actually, how, how do you change the culture um, and attitudes of academia um, so that other activities apart from uh, publishing is valued, which I think speaks to this, this point around incentives. Um, and if you can hold three things in your mind all at once, I would say I think there's something really interesting about public incentives on social platforms. Certainly the research we did with you um, with shift on, on vaccination showed that there were also incentives for how you were valued by your peers in sharing information as well, that, that we also need to think about the design of social media environments and not just the design of academia. Um, so um, if, if I can go to um, Daniel again, um, and, and then whoever would like to follow. Goodness, the, 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 there's a lot in there. Um, so I'll pick a few a few points. Um, so I'll pick, I guess, as a juxtaposition, the design of the social media and talk a little bit about that and, the, and also the how, how to change the research system. Um, so design of social media, absolutely, there's lots of research now about that social media platforms are designed in a way to encourage interaction, uh, to encourage us to click and to like and to share. Um, and that is, uh, that, that triggers our ideas about status and influence. We like that more of our tweets are shared, that um, we, we see sort of validation in that, and that validation encourages us to, to do more. So, so there's absolutely um, uh, evidence of that. Um, the issue there obviously is not just to do with science, it's a generic one to do with, with, with platforms. The question is how, do, what do we do about it in, in, with respect to scientific and, and health misinformation? And I know that the online platforms like Twitter, uh, Facebook have tried during the COVID um, crisis to respond by, for example, prioritizing messages from WHO at the top of the, of the uh, making them more, more prominent. But, but the fundamental problem is though those steps, although welcome, are small compared to the, the, the basic design of the platform. If the whole platform is designed to get people to share and to emotionally connect um, with messages and, and kind of chase the likes, then, then just um, giving a bit more prominence to WHO messages will not solve the problem. Uh, the, there isn't a, a quick solution uh, to it, we need to, to look at how the platforms were designed in the first place. When you speak to many of the designers working in the early days of Facebook and, and other platforms, they, they do say and they acknowledge that they, they specifically uh, chased um, that or, or built in, designed in those kind of triggers to, to share emotional content and, and increase, um, increase uh, interactivity. Um, purposefully. So basically, it's in the DNA of the platform. It's, you can't easily remove it now. Uh, we have le to learn lessons about future platforms that we design. And we have to, I, I believe, have more social science perspectives in the design teams, uh, in tech teams. One of the things I've written about is you need to disrupt the disruptors. 
So in my tag teams in Welcome, uh, which uh, work in funding data, I introduced two social scientists and embedded them in, among the data scientists and the software developers. And the, the work of the social scientists is to ask awkward questions of the techs and say, well, hold on a second, I know that that, that, that product works, but what, but what if it works too well? I, what happens if it works as intended, but all, all, you know, in the long term, it has different consequences. And that has been very important to us. And, and I think more tech teams need to do that. Then the second point is about the research system is a huge um, question. The only way we're gonna shift it is by acting in concept. So for example, Research Institute, we have 20 different funders involved. We're also talking to about a dozen of the top publishers. So it needs a significant percentage of people moving together to make a difference. Um, and the, the, the power brokers who are effect effectively the, the funders, the journals, and the universities, they're the three uh, types of organization that has the most influence on the behavior of researchers. They need to basically move in concert. They all know that there's a problem with reproducibility, for example, pressure to publish, uh, lack of publishing of negative findings, all of those things. They know the problem, but they can't solve it individually. It has to work in concert. They have to work together. Thank you. Um, we've we've got um, four minutes left before we're going to wrap up. And, and when we wrap up, I'd like each of you to share one reflection that you're leaving with. Um, but to finish answering this question, if I can go to Patricia and then, then Teo for um, some reflections on our poster's question um, and Daniil's points. Thank you. Um, I think I'm just, because we've got four minutes left, I just talked the key messages really from today's talk. Um, all the presentations were really, I think, well, firstly, really great presentations, but also um, this idea about, I think some of the key things that have come out is really thinking about how we trust, um, how academics trust the public, which I think is really um, what we need to really focus more on. Um, and, you know, both myself, um, Dan um, Daniel and Teo both spoke about this ways in which, you know, academics have often operated on this idea of the public as deficit, as deficient, as not being able to understand. And what's been really um, interesting um, and useful, actually, from the anti vaxxers movement is how sophisticated and how they've really challenged a lot of these preconceptions which have forced, which, you know, shouldn't have been there in the first place, but um, they've forced us to, to think about public in a very nuanced and complicated way. And I think this is something that um, we have to engage with um, and use um, constructively in the way that we design research, the way we communicate research. Um, and I think that's something that's really important. Um, and I think, you know, you've asked a few times, Carla, about who is responsible for this or where the obligation lies. I think it's really complicated. Um, but I think ultimately this is something that academics themselves have been asking for for a really long time, that we need time to think through, we need time to publish. Nobody, very few people benefit in the current system and the facts and the truths are getting hurt in this process. Um, so institutions and funders also need to take a key part in um, really trying to reshape um, academia and science that we have the space um, ultimately to benefit science by producing things that we're confident in and that produces confidence. Um, I think those are some of the key things I took away from today, but also to sort of add to some of the things that were said before. Thank you. And Teo? Um, I think, yeah, we've had such a rich discussion and I've really appreciated it. Um, I think just to um, pick up on the point of system incentives, I really resonated with what Daniel described um, in terms of like the incentives, especially on social media um, for um, people to share. Um, one addition to that is if we take a systems view again, um, there's a bit in the healthier internet report that um, Chloe created, which you can find at healthierinternet.org, um, which talks about following the money. Um, and I think it was, I'm just checking now, um, a researcher, David um, from Bronze, I cannot pronounce his name, from George Washington University, I'll send you um, a link. And he was really talking about following the money and incentive structures on the platform. So on Twitter, on um, YouTube, um, and actually I think he found that there was um, most of the 
um, anti-vaccination content that you find online is actually produced by two Russian like company bots basically. So I think really looking at those incentive structures, like what is what is what is making it worthwhile to make this information available um, in an online space. I'm I still think regardless of what information is happening, we're probably not going to stop um, people from doing the fast sharing that we see and do every day. Um, but I do think we can trace things back into the system and like identify why we are making it easy and um, you know attractive to um, operate in these ways um, and then my final reflection I think I won't say too much because um, I think um, a lot of it's already been said is just to pick up on Patricia's quote which I love which is very few people are benefiting from the current system um, and I think that like really makes concrete the issue at hand like we really need to rethink the system almost from the ground up and really excavate what we have done and the years of legacy and maybe colonialism and patriarchy that we've built this system upon and try to maybe see how we can start to dismantle um, the things that aren't working or benefiting us today. Wow, fantastic. Lots of great reflections from everyone. I'm, I'm so pleased we were able to dig into all, all the shades of grey and, and didn't spend a, an hour berating the public uh, uh, for, for their misinformation spreading. Um, some, some things that I've taken away are really the, the, the need to look inwards um, in terms of academia and think what, what what, how do we need to be fit um, for now and for going forward? And that that's not actually just for thinking about misinformation. It's not just for thinking about online, but it seems like misinformation on online and plus crises really is sort of um, showing where we're fraying at the edges that, that, that we need to pay attention to. Um, there's a real need to think about incentives um, from all sides. What are the incentives for... Uh, Russian bots, what are the incentives for sharers, what are the incentives for researchers, and then to think about how do we design around that, so if we've got that human understanding um, of all of those incentives, how do we design around it, and importantly, how do we make sure that that ends up in with a system in which everyone feels that they have a stake, they're able to produce valuable work, whether you're a public member uh, or researcher. Um, the importance of frontline workers, where, um, wherever they are, that, that feels really key in, in mediation, both on, on and offline. Um, and mutual trust and understanding was really clear. It was really clear that it needs to be much better understanding between the public and scientists about how each other thinks, what they value, how they work. Um, when things are out in the open, what, what does it mean? Um, and changing signals and brands. So what does it mean to, um, what are signifiers of excellence and expertise? There's some real questions around what those are now. Um, and I, I guess as social people, we would all say this, wouldn't we? But the real need for more social um, expertise, society expertise to be embedded in the redesign of all of those systems, whether it's thinking through um, Researchers' relationship with the public, um, or, or um, whether it's the own internal mechanisms and, and systems are, for how that work, or, or social media itself, um, and, and um, importantly, how we think about power and power brokerage. So, thank you, everyone, for um, a really fascinating discussion. Um, thank you for giving up your Saturday mornings, um, and then a, a, a double thank you, Patricia, for a Saturday morning whilst on holiday um, from a, a magnificent hotel room. Um, so, yeah, I, I'll, I'll give you, since we can't see an audience, um, I'll give you an audience clap from here and say so look forward to contributing um, to the conversation um, Thank offline. Thanks so much, Carla. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. That was great. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. All the best. Thank you.